All right. Hello, everybody, and welcome. Thank you for joining us. We're excited to have you with us today in the third session of our webinar series, Excellence in Team-Based Care for the Underserved. My name is Mariah Blake, and I'm the staff assistant here at the Association of Clinicians for the Underserved. Today's program, Preventing and Eliminating Burnout in Practice, will be presented by Dr. Eileen Barrett of the University of New Mexico's Department of Inter Internal Medicine. We just have a few quick housekeeping items to go over before we let Dr. Barrett take it away. ACU is a national nonprofit focused on the recruitment and retention of clinicians in underserved areas. We do that through projects like our Star Center Workforce Project, National Health Service Corps Advocacy, and training and resources for clinicians of all disciplines. Supporting all of you doing this great work is part of what brought us to this webinar series today. We hope that we at ECU can be a reliable learning source for our members and all clinicians and teams providing care to underserved and vulnerable populations. We're always striving to improve care for our underserved communities, and we hope that this webinar series will provide you with resources to strengthen your organization's ability to provide effective and meaningful care. This webinar series was developed in partnership with the Centene Corporation. Over the years, Centene has supported ECU in multiple projects, aiming to identify ways to support the improvement of healthcare for the underserved. Um, we're especially happy to have Joyce Lurkin uh, with us today, though I'm not sure uh, she can hop on the line, uh, but thank you for joining if you're out there. <laughs> sure, Mariah, it's Joyce Lurkin, I am on the line. Oh, great to hear from you. Um, if you just want to say a couple words. Well, we are excited, and uh, it's our pleasure to partner with ACU. Of course, we're looking forward to seeing a lot of you at the National Conference where we can continue dialogue around uh, today's issues and other issues that are affecting our clinicians, our health centers, and, of course, the patients we serve. But again, thank you so much for the opportunity to work with all of you at ACU. Great. Joyce, thank you for your partnership, and thank you for being with us today. All right, your organizers on the line today are myself, Mariah Blake, and ACU Health Policy Fellow, Gabby Whitty. Both our contact information is available to you here. Uh, Gabby will be handling the technical side of today's webinar. If at any point you experience technical difficulties, please send her a message through the chat box or the questions box in the control panel, or uh, send her an email at the email listed here. All right, a couple more pointers here. Uh, we are recording today's webinar, and we'll send out a follow-up email with instructions on how to access this recording and a copy of the slides later today. So keep an eye out for that. You can also access a copy of the slides in the handout section of your control panel throughout the presentation. That should be on the right side of your screen. One CME credit will be awarded for today's webinar. We'll submit a list of anybody who wants CME credit to double AFP, and we will send you an e-certificate acknowledging the credit you received attending this or any other webinars in this series at the conclusion of the series. If you would like to receive CME credit for today's webinar, please send us an email by the end of next week. We love to be able to ha help answer questions, so please ask them. We plan to reserve the last 10 to 15 minutes of the hour for Q&A. While the audience will remain muted throughout today's session, you can submit questions in the chat box or the questions box, both of which are located in the control panel. We will be taking note of all questions asked throughout the presentation, so feel free to submit them at any time. You don't need to wait until the end. We hope you'll use this time to relax and have fun with us as we discuss provider wellness so you can leave today's session feeling refreshed and ready to tackle burnout in your organization. One final note, uh, please stick around through the end of the webinar to fill out a short evaluation to help us to continue to improve our training techniques. Once the webinar ends, the evaluation will appear on your screen. We'd love to hear your feedback on today's presentation, and we welcome your suggestions for topics for future webinars through the evaluation as well. All right, we are happy to present this webinar with Dr. Eileen Barrett. Dr. Barrett is an assistant professor at the University of New Mexico's Department of Internal Medicine. Today, she will revisit her program that she presented at ECU's 2016 annual conference to discuss organization, organizational strategies and specific interventions to promote retention and recruitment by reducing burnout and increasing job satisfaction. 
There will be several polls throughout today's presentation, so please stay engaged. We're excited to have Dr. Barrett back with us today, and now I'll let her take it away. Thank you so much, Mariah. I'm incredibly grateful and am so honored to continue to, to continue the or contribute to the good work that the ACU is doing, and I'm truly grateful for, um, for their leadership in this area and commitment to service. So uh, with that moving forward, then um, our next slide, mine did not advance. I'm going to try that again. Oh, there we go. Here we are. Thank you. Uh, so as you heard, my name is Eileen Barrett, and I am on faculty of the University of New Mexico. And the materials that I'll be presenting here are uh, materials that I've had the advantage of learning a lot about through collaboration with one of my professional societies, which is called the American College of Physicians, and then also with Hennepin County Medical Center. And with my two colleagues you see listed there, Mark Linzer and Sarah Poplow. So first, to just lay out the scope of the problem, which is that we know that wellness and burnout are in the news. These are some different headlines that are from some national and also regional outlets. As you can see in the top left, that that's from the New York Times. From the right is from the Washington Post. And at the bottom, the News and Observer is actually in Raleigh, North Carolina. And I say this to say that our colleagues who are experiencing burnout or are concerned that they're at risk for burnout, that they are not alone. This is very, very common. It, it is, um, unfortunately, it really is a hot topic right now, and it needs to be because it is um, a pressing public health concern. So first, uh, what is, oh, sorry. First, we'll have our quick poll. Make sure that you feel um, engaged. And um, we'll ask you to answer this question, which as you can see, are you concerned that a clinician you know is burned out? And for a clinician, of course, um, much of this talk will be about physicians because that's where we have the most amount of data and it's most well studied. But it's a problem that we're not studying this and we don't have enough information for how burnout is affecting our social workers, our nurse care managers, our RNs, our LPNs, um, MSWs, and our uh, NPs, our PAs, really everyone who's a member of the service. Um, a member of our healthcare team. And um, like it is now available to you, we can see that 73% of this call are, are concerned about someone they know, and it may be also them. Um, so it's really important that you're here, and thank you for your commitment to this work. So then, um, but first, what is burnout and what does it do? So what's so important to know about burnout is that it's a long-term stress reaction. And um, there's lots of different specific scientific explanations, and most of us, I think we know it when we see it, but it also is that emotional um, exhaustion and also the depersonalization, meaning that we really don't feel, we're not as connected to everyone else anymore because we're so exhausted at work or maybe even when we get home from work. And it's important to know that more than half of physicians have sign of, signs of burnout. The data suggests that there may be even more dentists who are burned out. It's not as well studied for their other colleagues in other uh, disciplines. And what's important is that this number has actually increased in time. It was about 46% in 2012. Most recent studies, it's closer to 52%. We do know that burnout, it does affect quality of care. And I think that it does make sense that it can cause depression. And as we know, depression can also cause suicide. Um, so it's really important that we do this work. We do know that more women physicians than male physicians are affected by burnout. Um, possibly more male nurses are, have burnout than female nurses. We know that it undermines the doctor-patient relationship. It probably affects all the other provider uh, and clinician-patient relationships in the same way that we knew it, know it does for physicians. And that I hope that what by outlining this as something that is common, that affects quality of care, that affects our mental health, our personal health, and that is widespread, that you will um, believe me that this is an emergent health, health, public health threat, and it is not a personal failing in any way. And in fact, if we saw that something that we knew to affect quality of care and personal care was affecting so many people, we would probably have um, we would probably have a similar response to the way that we did for things like pandemic flu. And so we really need to think about burnout like that, something that needs a very systematic, uh, systematic solutions. So with that, um, um, I mentioned briefly about burnout, how we usually know it when we see it. This is a quote that I saw that was in the magazine called The Atlantic. 
and it's from uh, Dr. Richard Gunderman, who is a radiologist. And as you can see there, but for those who may be multitasking, then I'll read it. And what it reads is that professional burnout is a sum total of hundreds and thousands of, 20, of tiny betrayals of purpose, each one so minute that it hardly attracts notice. I think that that resonates with you the same way that it resonates with me. And I think that it speaks to uh, the reason why we're here, but um, also how it really is the product of things that take us away from our commitment to care of the patients. Um, so I want to ask you first, before we move forward, um, your answer to this question, which is that um, the statement of burnout in medicine, nursing, dentistry, social work, and similar caring professions is inevitable. I'd like to hear your answer for that, because that's what we're going to spend a lot of time on. Sometimes we worry about things like compassion fatigue, and those are very similar constructs as burnout, but it's actually a little bit different. So let's weigh in on that. And, and it looks like, um, great, uh, so over half of us believe that, um, that this is um, not inevitable, but it does look like a quarter of us um, think that maybe that it is. And I hope that you can see by being in this call and seeing the information and learning about the information presented here that, it, that, that we actually can predict burnout, we also can then prevent it. So I talked before about how um, uh, burnout is a long-term stress reaction, and I think we should really look to the scientific underpinnings of, um, of behavioral psychology. And this is um, one of the things that we talk about with job stress is what predicts it. And I think it makes sense. We've all felt it. And stress isn't always something bad. Um, stress is what helps us get out of bed every morning and take care of the kids and go to work and pay our mortgage. But what's really important to know, and I'm going to ask you to really buy into this, which is that demand and control predict job stress. And I think that that resonates and that will make sense to you, right? And when there are more demands, then it means that we're going to have more stress. But when we have more control, it offsets job stress. But importantly, that when we can support people, we can actually augment that power of having control over your workplace and control over your day. And that really means that control and support will relieve stress because they offset that pressure that we feel from demands. And that's why that scale is there, so we can understand that there's a balance. Um, but so first, when we think about supporting that idea of a balance, there's things that we can do that are um, to support wellness that are very personal approaches. First is that the term, if you've heard people say hangry, it's a term for a reason. It means hungry and angry. So we do have to make sure that we're eating, that we're eating healthfully, that we're um, staying well hydrated. I live in New Mexico where people are constantly dehydrated, but we're not the only ones. It's everyone who goes through their day and um, doesn't get um, enough time to be able to eat and drink. We do want to make sure that we have good sleep habits, um, that we're exercising that we're talking with our colleagues. And um, we want to be careful that um, sometimes you do need to rant, and there's some therapeutic value. But we want to make sure that we choose that carefully, because we don't know, do know that people who engage in negative spirals, it's hard to get out of that. But people, we also have the opportunity to engage in positive spirals. And in fact, in some research studies, people who are able to engage in a uh, positive spiral, those are uh, very resilient, um, happy, and non-burned out clinicians. Um, we also always need to have a chance to reflect with our colleagues on their care, on our workplaces, our lives, and also do our best to nurture resilience. So how do we nurture resilience? You know, of course, resilience is the ability to bounce back from something. Um, and it is not a value judgment. It's just a statement of fact. We need to do things to support our ability to bounce back. So one of those is knowing what our values are, know what we believe in. And again, this idea of our, that we are knowing our values, we are committed to them, and our lives reflect our values. And that includes in our clinical practice, but also at home. We also want to make maintain connections. That's with our patients, with our colleagues, with our families, our friends. We want to practice mindfulness, which is that um, being uh, uh, conventionally people talk about that as being present um, and knowing that you can respond to something rather than react. We also want to be careful to um, exercise gratitude. Um, I worked with a, um, with a clinician when we were talking about this, and one of the things that in his family that they do is every day at dinner that um, their kids, they ask them to say five things they were grateful for that day. And I hadn't heard of families doing that together. I think it's beautiful. There also is some research that when um, people reflect 
very deliberately on things that they're grateful for every day. That they, those people, if they do that every day, that they are happier people. And I think that that makes sense. And I also want to ask us all to avoid over-efficiency. I know that um, today I was coming to this webinar and on my way here, I'm almost at the car and I ran into a patient who needed me. So that over-efficiency um, had to stay with my patient. We all, we all know what that feels like, but we need to do our best that we can to sort of structure in to our days um, more um, wiggle room for the things that we know that come up. None of us can be 100% efficient all the time. So before we move on to the next sections, I will ask, we'd like to do another polling question, which is um, uh, uh, ask for this, that healthcare organizations, practices, and institutions can eliminate and prevent burnout by which of the following? And I'm going to ask you to vote for, uh, vote for these. And one of them is increasing support in your environment, increasing control over your schedule, enhancing your values alignment between the leaders and the individuals, reducing time pressure, or is it none of the above? And ask you to vote on those. And moving forward, and lots of people voted. Thank you. And um, I am so grateful that there is no one who indicated none of the above, because everyone here was correct that we can do all of these things that can eliminate and also ultimately prevent burnout. Good job, team. So, let's see, and next slide. A little bit slow coming back from the polling question, and I apologize. Uh, let's see, my slide is not advancing, so I may have to ask for um, help. Oh, there it is, thank you. So again, what does the research, research then tell us? And it sounds as though um, that people here who voted, they know this intuitively makes sense. So a few things, one of them is that our long-term relationships with patients promote satisfaction. And then I think that that makes sense. Also that um, how our work interferes with our home lives um, instead of complementing our home lives and our, uh, will strongly predict burnout. And in fact, actually strongly predicts someone's plans to leave their practice and indeed leaving the practice within 18 months. That is the most important factor. And that ultimately satisfaction and sustainability are predicted by time pressure, work control, the work pace or the degree of chaos in your environment, and ultimately the organizational culture, which is how do your values, your personal values, like your commitment to your patients, how are those reflected in um, what the leadership values? So I'm gonna ask you to remember pressure, control, chaos and culture. So we really need our organizations to act to reduce burnout and support wellness. And again, the way that we do that is to support or to intervene on those things, time pressure, control, chaos, and culture. And when we talk about chaos, I'm going to ask you to, um, I think that that intuitively makes sense, but um, this is one of those examples where that saying from the former Supreme Court um, Justice Potter Stewart replies when he was ruling on um, pornography, he said, I don't know how to define it, but I know it when I see it. I'm going to ask you to believe that about chaos too. Some of those examples would be, say, in the clinic, if um, the printer is always um, down the hallway, down another hallway through a door, and you have to print um, wellness summaries or patient education materials for your patients, but every time you have to do that, you're sprinting around. Um, or it's that one of the printers always runs out of paper or it is that you're constantly interrupted when you're working with the patients, or that every day is something different and every day you have a different team. Regardless, you know, those are the examples I mentioned. Those are things that happened in my primary care clinic um, at some point, and then we took interventions to, uh, to address those. But it also happens in, um, uh, in the hospital also too. I do work in a hospital right now. And say, for example, one of the examples was the number of calls you had to make to get certain things done to take care of the patients. And the things we can do well, we can identify with those with those chaotic, uh, what that chaos is in your day, and you int intuitively know what that is. And what we need to do is believe each other when we talk about chaos. So where do we start when we decide? Yes, we all agree burnout is a problem. We seventy five percent of us are concerned about um, about a colleague, and um, and now um, all of us believe that there are things our institutions can do to eliminate um, and also prevent burnout. So the first thing I'm going to ask you to do is value the work of others. Lots of people are working on this. We all have friends and colleagues who care, and we should be working together. Also, don't underestimate the power of small changes. 
those changes such as um, having moving the printer, about having um, that you have uninterrupted time with the patient, those are not small changes and they really, really make a difference. Um, and also just always keep in mind that you can predict it, remedy it, and also prevent it. So very a specific tool that I'd like you to be able to leave with, if you remember nothing else from the things that I'll be talking about today, is I'd like you to go into your, um, open up your uh, uh, internet um, connection and, um, and search for stepsforward.org um, and look specifically for steps forward and burnout. And this is a module, and I don't get a toaster if anyone uses it. I was one of the faculty. And this is developed through the American Medical Association. It actually applies to non-physicians. It applies to practices in all types of environments. And it's free, whether you're a member of the AMA, whether you're a physician or not, no matter what kind of colleague we are, the precepts here are the things that we're talking about on this webinar and that you can use to work with your colleagues. And this is a uh, this is a toolkit that is all the steps that you need. So with that, the foundation of, um, of this toolkit is that burnout has a science to it. So I know that people are surveyed out, but this is, in order to intervene on something or in order to relieve something, we have to be able to understand its causes. And every practice has different reasons why their providers are burned out when they have burnout. So when you hear the expression from um, in the Tolstoy novel in Anna Karenina, all happy families are alike, and all unhappy families, they are unhappy in their own ways. I believe that that applies to our clinical practice too. People whose practice where it's working perfectly, it's completely different than the people who where it's not. And the challenges in my practice are different than the challenges in yours. So when we can study it, that's how we know where to act. So this is in that toolkit I mentioned. It's free. It's one page. And this is a great place to start. So what do you do when you have that information? So first you do is you work with your group and you administer the mini-Z anonymously. The best way to do this, of course, is to work in collaboration with your leadership in whatever level of group. So if you want to do it solely for your clinic or you want to do it um, uh, organization-wide, it doesn't matter as long as you have the buy-in of the leaders and you have the buy-in of your colleagues to give this a chance. And, um, and the way to give it a chance, if you want to use my slides and the information I presented before, having to do with the percentages of burnout and the adverse effects, please feel welcome to use this information. Um, so what you want to do is administer the mini-Z anonymously. I would recommend making sure that when you're reporting the results that the survey is always given to more than five people, otherwise you can kind of you might be able to not, it'll be harder to ensure anonymity. Then you're going to want to compile them and report them. And again, it's only 10 questions, so that shouldn't be too much of a burden. And then use these results to determine where to start. And again, focus on the idea of time pressure, chaos. Um, what's the culture like? Meaning how are your personal values reflected in those of the leadership? And then also control, the control that you have over your day. Then what you do is you make, make those changes. You make them big and you make them small and you reassess with the same survey, always reporting the results to everyone, at least annually. And you just repeat as needed also too, and be sure that you celebrate your successes. Because sometimes people, um, it would be hard to remember what all the things that you did right in the group to take care of each other, what they were at the end of the year. Some specific examples that they'll talk about when you go to that um, Steps Forward module on burnout will be um, some things I'm gonna highlight here. And again, there's a lot of talk about physicians here, but this applies to everyone in the team. So the first, first things having to do with what our organizations can do, one is just have protected time for reflection. We're in meetings. Um, people have time to just reflect on what their day was like together and their collective challenges and rewards. Also, the time that people can have together. I know one of my friends who works um, on the remote um, Navajo reservation, I used to work there with her too, she started a, um, a meditation group and they would just get together on um, uh, once a week in a quiet part of the of the clinic and a group um, who were all volunteers of course they self-selected that they just did a quiet reflection and meditation in my hospital a palliative care physician and a palliative care social worker has sort of the same thing also do undergoing resiliency training that's really important that's the ability to bounce back and our organizations can take the lead in that Peer support, I think, speaks for itself. We need to look out for each other. One way to do so is our organization structure that into our roles. I know that when I signed my contract, it said in my contract who was going to be my mentor. And when I was assigned a mentee, um, that, uh, that was in her contract as well, too, so that we are, our job is to support each other. 
Also, I cannot overstate the value of having healthy foods whenever you have meetings. Um, there's actually some really good data that when our organizations um, promote healthy foods, we will make better decisions. And, um, and I think it intuitively makes sense that we all feel better when we have healthy foods. Um, and lastly, improving the physical environment. You know, there were some studies that were done in the 70s on patients who were in the hospital after surgery, and the people who were closer to the window, um, they had fewer needs for pain medications because they had less pain, and they also left the hospital sooner. So if the physical environment affects the patient so much, why would it affect us? Well, of course it does. So that is things like having good lighting, maybe having, um, you know, if you, it costs the same if you paint the color of the clinic walls tan or if you cut paint them something pretty, we should look for doing things like that. Um, and also having some artwork, um, especially artwork that inspires us. So some another great reference for you is here. It's the call to action, creating a culture of health. It's also free. You can Google it now from the American Hospital Association. And they make a great case for things you can do in your organization and also for your leadership. A lot of us work have worked in organizations where you have a great idea, you have a great idea, and then someone hires a consultant and they come in and they take everyone's great ideas and suddenly your leadership listens. Well, sometimes it's easier to hear something from a quote outside expert. And this call to action is actually that outside expert with great ideas. They include having workplace wellness programs. A workplace wellness program actually is well designed, even if not expensive, the return on investment is two to three to one. I mean, that's tremendous. Um, we also should have engaged leaders who are committed to this idea of wellness, who talk about it. Um, also, our leaders who will protect us from the unnecessary challenges. In the best of times, the practice of clinical care is always going to be challenging because our patients have needs. That's why we chose it. But that means that we really need to be protected from things that are unnecessarily challenging, such as um, having uh, different teams every day, having chaos sprinting through your day, all day, missing meetings, things like that, and also doing everything we can to provide people with the support to do the job in the way that they want to do it. Because the thing is, we all want to take care of the patients. That's why we're here. We just need more support to do so. So some specific examples of how we can be protected from unnecessary challenges. Um, uh, one of them is to reduce the time pressure again and allow more control. Some examples are extending appointment times. We should be more realistic that in an era when it takes us five to seven minutes just to do the medication reconciliation, and it also takes us um, seven to 10 minutes to document, well, we're going to need longer appointment slots. That, that just makes sense. Most primary care should have 30-minute visits, except for, for like the urgent care visits. Um, and some of those may need that too. Um, we also should have a manageable census, and that's also a manageable panel size as well. And also for people who are um, um, hospital-based providers or people who have assigned panels that we need to be realistic that our patients are only becoming more medically complex and their care is more and more comprehensive. So um, it also means that we need to have a manageable size. We should also redistribute work appropriately and some ways to do that would be team-based care. And you can see on the right-hand side I have this, that little icon and that's because that steps forward I mentioned has a toolkit for implementing team-based care. And the idea there is everyone in the team works toward the highest level of their licensure um, so that the work that, say, your RN is doing, some of that work may be able to be done um, through our um, incredibly capable and hardworking MAs. And some of the work that's being done by our incredibly hardworking, capable MAs can probably be done by the clerks. So we have some opportunities to help people work at the highest level of their licensure and have a true redistribution, redistribution for true team-based care. Another thing that people can consider would be to have a scribe um, and also to have MA order entry. Some organizations will hesitate at the idea of having scribes, um, and I'm going to ask all of them to reconsider for a couple reasons. One of them is that the providers love it, and in most places it's cost neutral because none of us minded taking care of the patients. It was all the things that got in the way of taking care of the patients. And in organizations that adopt scribes, what they tend to find is that they actually the providers can see more patients because that's not what they ever minded. In fact, that's what they wanted to do. And the patients tend to be happier. So um, that's a, a fantastic option. I think particularly for people who are involved in care of the underserved, because our underserved communities have so many people who haven't had enough educational opportunities afforded to them. And so these are really good jobs in the healthcare sector for people who are smart, hardworking, and haven't been given as much opportunity as the rest of us. Uh, this is also a great opportunity to consider MA order entry instead of having our PAs, NPs, 
um, and, uh, and physicians doing a lot of this order entry. Um, sometimes the reason why um, people mistakenly think that this work must be done by, uh, um, by the providers is because they misunderstand the meaningful use requirement from CMS. And actually, it just needs to be done by a provider. It, uh, by an, by, um, it can be done by an MA. It doesn't have to be done by a provider. And that's very much that's straight out of CMS. Um, and then the last thing I'm going to ask is this is so important. And everyone, I'm going to ask you to um, commit to the pledge. And I cannot see you, and you cannot see me. I'm going to ask you to raise your right hand and repeat after me, which is that we have to just say, we, will, we all know that the, it's terrible to hear, it's just three more clicks. Why won't you do it? And I think we all know that the problem with three more clicks is three more clicks easily becomes 150. So I'm going to ask you, raise your right hand, repeat after me. I will never say it's just three more clicks. I'll say it one more time. I will never say it is just three more clicks. So with that, will you take the pledge? And I'm going to ask you to vote when you've done it. But if you need more time and you need to be convinced that it's important, I want to hear that too. So while you're voting, we will move forward. Great, and so, um, um, okay, so we've got almost almost everyone, not everybody, and that's okay. Um, some people need more time. Well, then that's why we're gonna keep going through the rest of this webinar. And so those 93% of people, I thank you. You are changing the world. And um, so some other things we wanna do to increase control, forgive me, um, is uh, we need to have a more, an order is not I will have order, it means just more, um, uh, that we can be more systematic in what we do, and we need to have less chaos. And some ways we can do that would be include would include having um, true teamwork and care coordination. One example of that would be to um, ha implementing a daily team huddle. Um, on the bottom part of the page, you'll see that uh, that blue box is because that steps forward. They have an instruction kit, a toolkit for how to have a daily huddle. Um, and uh, People who have daily huddles, they tend to love them. I'm one of those people. It can really be transformative. Um, and that when we do our care coordination, what does that mean for people who aren't familiar? It is the pre-visit planning. Um, it also is those huddles and then having care protocols and also having standing orders. Standing orders, I, I can't speak highly enough about how standing orders transform our care because everyone in the team works toward the highest level of their licensure. Everyone is engaged. Everyone has ownership. And, um, and the patients tend to love it too because the care tends to be better, tends to be more efficient also too. We also should do our best to pilot unique schedules. Um, the important thing is I'm not saying people should get in early or people should stay late or they should work on weekends or should work part-time. My idea is we need to have, or my, I implore you is have flexibility. I'll say that um, in my primary care clinic when I worked in um, evening clinic, I loved it. It wasn't for everybody. I loved it because um, because I would come in late that day, uh, that would be my morning when I would always get a good long workout in, read the paper, run some errands, would come in for afternoon clinic and evening clinic. The evening clinic was, um, it was just quieter and, uh, and my patients loved it, my MA, my nurse loved it. That was fabulous. I know other people who feel that way actually about having instead, um, they like to come in on weekends. That's not what I want, but it was what they want. The point is that we should be asking people that what they want and doing our best to accommodate them. And this can also actually help relieve um, some of the time pressures and sort of the crowding in that we have of our clinics when we're limited for space. And the best use of our space is to spread things out, have some things in the evening, some things on weekends. This also can be great for caregiving um, providers, so um, and also caregiving um, uh, non-provider uh, staff, because um, people who have little kids or have a parent who have needs, if they also need flexibility in their day, and so for some of them being working in the evening or only working part-time or only working on the weekend, that will work better for them. And we should really embrace this idea of flexibility. So, um, uh, so my next slide is um, things we can do to promote shared values. I think this speaks for, um, it speaks for itself, but we should reward and recognize our colleagues in big and small ways. Uh, we should also do our best to um, really make sh uh, remind our leaders, inspire our leaders that they will value well-being. Uh, and then as much as possible, tie the work that we are doing to our own values. There's a saying that makes sense, which is that the, um, the secret to a happy, li happy life is to live a life that is consistent with your values. And that is at home, but of course it's also at work, and that's usually connecting us to the care of the patients and also to the care of each other. Um, we should also do our best to provide resources for, um, for a committee that, that specifically is dedicated to this work. 
you know your organization best. Some organizations will respond to the idea of a provider wellness committee. Some um, that may sound too um, foofy or woo-woo, and instead what will um, resonate there is satisfaction and sustainability. Uh, for some places, actually, instead it will be recruitment and retention, because as we know, uh, every recruiting problem starts with a retention problem. You know what it is for your organization, um, but that uh, starting one can make a difference, but that we should provide resources for it. And if we are going to benchmark how many patients get flu shots, how many patients have an A1C less than seven, how many people had a mammogram, we should be benchmarking our staff satisfaction and well-being as much as we do all of these other measures of quality. So how do you, um, so, sorry, so the first change that you think you can make, and I'm going to ask everyone to vote, so you can see them there, starting a wellness committee, having meeting, meetings with meaning, and the idea where we talk about our values, and we connect the values to what we do every day, uh, that we encourage healthy foods at meetings, uh, we implement standing orders and care protocols, or exploring team documentation and order entry, and I'm going to ask everyone to vote. And we're getting our results, and um, so great. Lots of people, great ideas with the, um, with the diversity of plans moving forward. I commend you. Good for you. This is a fabulous, fabulous start. You are changing the world. So with our uh, next slide then. Um, so how do we make our case? Uh, earlier, there were about 7% of people felt like they weren't yet ready to say, yes, I'm going to take the pledge, and that's okay. But or you're someone who was in that, I took my pledge, that I will never say it's just three more clicks, and I want to start a wellness committee, or I want to have healthy foods at the meeting, or I want to have our care protocols. How do you make your case for change? Because for some people, this is more intuitive than others, and it's not a value judgment. Um, and uh, first is that quality of care can suffer. There's robust information that adherence with preventive measures um, goes down when, um, uh, when uh, in practices that are more burnt out. Also, um, adherence with diabetes care uh, recommendations. Uh, also with, um, excuse me, with um, uh, hand washing. Uh, we also then, because it's hand, hand washing and other, um, uh, and other uh, patient safety issues, we know that that can suffer when our colleagues are not well when they are burnt out. We also know, of course, that patient satisfaction can suffer, and that makes sense because the biggest driver of patient satisfaction is their relationship with the team, and if the team is burned out, then of course the satisfaction is going to be affected. Um, another way to do so is to just state that it's just a fact that unhappy, exhausted staff leaves. And I put in this photograph on purpose. This is a photograph of when I took a trip uh, to New Zealand. And um, I can't even tell you how many people I know, physicians who have been burned out and went to New Zealand and, <laughs> and practiced there and said how happy they were. That's not what I want. I want people to be happy here. Um, another way to make your case is to say that recruitment must suffer. It's very, very difficult to recruit to a burned out, unhappy practice because we know that people who are, who are looking for a job, they can smell burnout. They know. Um, when you want to make your case for change, also know that it's expensive to replace a burned out clinician who leaves the practice. Um, some research that was done in the 1990s said that it was, um, I think it was $250,000 to replace uh, an internist who leaves, and I think it was $246,000 to, to replace a family physician and $263,000 to replace a pediatrician. I couldn't find any information for dentists, social workers, and nurses. We desperately need that information. But also, that information is actually from the mid-1990s. Everything has only gotten more expensive from them. And most people, I know in my husband's practice, they calculate it's probably $500,000. Um, an outpatient, no-call family physician who I spoke with told me in their practice it, it was closer to um, over $300,000. So that's, it really makes the business case for this. We also should think that um, uh, having a float pool, which means that we know ex mistakes, accidents, and emergencies happen, we should just plan and that we need someone as backup. That can be cost-effective. Also, so can dedicated time for passion projects. I put in this photograph, this is Southern Colorado. I love to ski. Nobody's gonna pay me to ski. But some, I also love vaccines. And someone paid me to work on, um, on a project to increase the vaccination rate. And we actually gave, um, through the work that I was able to do with my multidisciplinary team, um, tremendous people, we actually gave 35,000 flu shots in one year. And we were able to increase the postpartum Tdap vaccination rate from 60% um, over 90%. And, um, and that kept me in the organization. It was great for our team. It was great for us to work together. And it was the best for the patients and the bottom line because we built for all those vaccines. 
Another way we can make our case for change is that our organizations, we really have an opportunity, especially in underserved areas, to model health for our communities, and we should strive for that. And the last thing is, it's a basic human decency. We should care about each other. And we do care about each other, so we should care about burnout and our colleagues who are at risk for burnout. So with my next slide then, sorry, there's a little bit of a delay. And this is just one more slide in making your business case, because maybe those um, 10 points that we just talked about it may not resonate with everyone. Or, you know what, people will say, you're right, the, without a margin, there isn't a mission. Well, without a mission, you're not going to have a healthcare team. But we still do need a margin. This is from Steps Forward also, too. Um, and it can help you make your business case. It's just real dollars for how much it costs. So in this case, um, what they're making, what you can make the case for here is how much money you can save by having, um, having uh, one of your, uh, your MA colleagues do your scribing for you. So in this case, um, the cost of the provider's time, in this case a physician, is probably $3 a minute. They work um, eight hours a day seeing patients, and it's about 220 days of clinic per year. Um, and that uh, for the physician, they have about 20 visits per day. I know for a lot of our um, advanced practice providers, this will actually be a higher number. And then how much time are they spending documenting? And you can just time this. For most people, it's close to 10. Some people I've talked to, they said it's actually much longer than that. Um, and then next, you compare that to how much it would cost in your organization to hire an MA who will be your, who will be your documentation specialist or scribe. I know at my husband's, um, where he works, um, it, the salary is actually lower than $23,000, excuse me, lower than $23 an hour. I know that in some places it's going to be higher. But you can get this information. But with this number that's here, you would end up um, saving in the bottom left corner over three hours a day in, in the um, provider documentation time. And then the annual savings there is just how much does it cost to hire the documentation specialist or scribe from how much time the provider is spending documenting. And it pays for itself as no time in no time there, as you can see, um, $90,000 you probably save in a year. And this, again, is so important for our underserved clinics. Um, where uh, there's such a provider shortage and so many people who are bright and hardworking and just haven't had the same educational opportunities to, um, to go to nursing school, to go to PA school, uh, to go to medical school. So on my next slide, and I'm so sorry that that's delaying a little bit the advancement, that I really want to ask you to just believe this, that we agree that there's a moral imperative to supporting wellness. I think it speaks for itself. We want to take care of our colleagues as well as we want to take care of our patients. And we really must address this issue of burnout as systematically as we've addressed other public health crises, um, because it truly is a public health crisis. So that's a lot of information in a short amount of time. And I'm so grateful to the ACU staff who invited me here and to everyone who took the time out of your busy day to participate in this webinar. And I will welcome you to email me with your questions. I'll also ask you to remember that you can go to that Steps Forward website. It is free. Um, you don't need to even give your email, and those resources could really um, help your practices, and I hope they help yours as much as they've helped mine. And uh, with that, I think we'll open it up to uh, questions and additional information from our colleagues at the ACU. All right. Thank you, uh, Dr. Barrett. Thank you very much for all of that information, and thank you to everybody who submitted questions, comments um, throughout the presentation. Um, we did reserve the last 15 minutes or so for a question and answer period, so if anybody has any questions that are coming up towards the end, uh, please feel free to submit those now. Um, just a note, we have had a couple of requests about the slides where you can access these. They are available right now in the handout section. For You can download them from the handout section of the control panel or we will make them available through our website afterwards. So you can download those and use those to make your case for change at your organization. Um, we did have a comment come in towards the end there um, as you were going through your uh, slides making the business case. Um, extended appointment time is obviously nice to do, but not practical in a setting where we are still being reimbursed per visit and cannot bill more than one service in the same day. Redistribution is more realistic. Um, I was just wondering, Dr. Baird, if you have any thoughts on that? I do, and I think that redistribution, I 100% agree, is, is, um, is the, a great option for a lot of practices. The extended appointment time um, for people who are employed, so if they're at an FQHC or if 
or just for one of the employed large employed practices. Um, one of the reasons, though, why that still we can still make the business case for why your practice may be able to do so is because when your providers leave, then you have a time period where no one is billing and you're still paying the rent, um, and where your patients are being picked up at other practices, and um, uh, and the more vacancies you have, the harder it is to recruit. Um, so uh, I would encourage people who have that concern to really look into how much um, into their in their practice it costs to replace and also to um, onboard a uh, a new colleague, and they may find that it actually pays for itself in a short amount of time. All right, thank you. And along that same thought, um, I just want to make a quick plug for our uh, NCA project, the Star Center. Um, we have a resource on there, the Financial Impacts tool, that will help you calculate a lot of these costs as well. If you want to head over to chcworkforce.org, um, we have a lot of resources like that. But jumping back into our questions, um, we had somebody ask, does giving up control and trusting others play into stress reduction? It seems like our clinicians who most desire control of patients or schedules or of outcomes feel the most burnt out. Oh, yeah. Gosh, that's a, I want to make sure that I answer that correctly. So um, first, uh, yeah, sometimes when someone feels like they need to increase, increase, increase control, um, it has to do with, of course, the trust in the team. It also could be a symptom that they are getting burnt out and they're afraid that they're going to miss something and make a mistake. Um, I do think that, like conscientious people everywhere, that um, providers are often, uh, we really struggle with the idea of control. For a lot of people who, and giving up that idea of control that maybe that I personally can do a better job than the order set, or I personally can do a better job than, um, than my amazing, colleague who uh, can um, has been empowered and trained to do this work to the peak of his or her licensure. For people who are seeing that their colleagues are struggling with um, control and relinquishing some of the things that have to do with working at the highest level of their licensure, one thing that is often very successful is to contrast, and, and not never in a punitive way, but with everyone's um, openness and willingness would be to contrast some of the um, care that is provided via the care protocols and, um, and to see whose outcomes are better and who's happier. I found that, say, for example, when we started having a protocol-driven um, uh, vaccination, that vaccination clinic that I mentioned, there were some people who really, really wanted to do it themselves. And they ended up being one, uh, we really, they were one over when they saw that how happy um, the patients were, how happy the, um, the nurse who was running the clinic was, and also how happy their colleagues were who didn't have to order the vaccine every single time, who didn't have to remember it every single time. And, um, uh, and, and that really won over the last of, of the holdouts, I would say. Um, I had the same experience when I work in a hospital and we converted from having a, um, a protocol for the management of critically ill patients with uh, DKA. I think most people on the call know what that is. And everyone wanted to do it their own way. And then we introduced this concept, introduced that there's data and how happy the nurses would be and the pharmacists would be if we all just followed a protocol. And that went over several people. And then when we um, just tracked the outcomes, which were those patients actually got better faster, then that won every last person in the organization over. So wrapping that up, because um, that's a complicated question and a great question. Um, some people who have a hard time giving up control, it may have to do with burnout. Some of them may respond to how well it's working. But we also should always look at, is it actually working? Because sometimes the reason why someone can't stop um, doing it themselves is because um, the system isn't working. So we always want to address that too. And maybe just ask those people what it is. That's the nice thing about that mini Z survey that I mentioned, that 10 point question. It's because people will say in there what's working and what's not. And you, we may find out, like, oh, we have this protocol, but actually no one's following it. And that's actually what we really need to, need to address, is make sure that everyone feels comfortable with the protocol and that it's well written um, so that it's being followed. And then um, the providers can give up control. Um, I hope that that answers the question that was asked. One of the things that's different about a webcam, right, is because then I can't see the person's expression. But I'll ask them maybe to send a clarifying question if, if there's one I can answer. Absolutely. Yeah, we're still welcoming any questions that anybody would like to send in as well as follow-up questions. 
Um, we did have one come in asking, how do you do a 30-minute appointment time but still see 20 patients per day? Are you including nurse and MA time in those minutes? Um, I, most of the practices that I know, it would be unusual for them to still see 20 patients a day is because then what they will do is then cut back on the sheer volume of patients that they're seeing and then instead have that, that in the 30-minute visit that more of the um, that uh, that some of that some of that some of those thirty minutes will overlap with some of the other thirty minutes, uh, meaning that um, some much of much of the work that is safely and usually done better um, by the non um, provider team members is also being done while you're with the patient. So, say for example, so first is one is um, usually then it's a fewer a smaller number of patients that are being seen, um, and uh, and that of course can pay for itself with the idea that your then your team isn't leaving <laughs> the practice, um, and for people who are resistant to do that do that I understand, but then at least that what they can start with is having giving providers the flexibility to um, choose patients who will get thirty minute follow ups instead of fifteen or twenty because we all know that a follow up is. Uh, Two follow-ups can be very, very different. One of them is for someone who's got a ton of medical problems and also a lot of maybe um, um, social issues that we want to address versus some of the patients who just don't have um, as many medical problems and that they can be the shorter visits. So we just need to have the flexibility. Right. Okay, our next question here. Um, is there any funding available to do further studies as well as pilots for other clinician groups? Did you have any funding for your organization? Uh, oh, good question. So the second one is no, no funding from anyone else. Um, let's see, in my organization, we did things very much, um, I've only ever worked in the uh, safety net, um, probably like everyone on this call, and there is very limited funding. And so that's where the role of really valuing even small changes starts. Um, so say, for example, when I described um, how we did more care protocols, um, there was no extra funding for it. Um, it was more of working with teams together, which was great because what do I know about what an MA needs to know? I trusted my MA to know what, what she or he needs to know. And the same thing with the RN and the same thing with the pharmacist. So we develop things together uh, and implement them together and troubleshoot them together. Um, and, uh, and did them in, um, in small, bite-sized um, uh, quantities. Um, as far as funding, they're probably some resource that would come to mind for me would be that um, looking through um, AHRQ for small um, for small grants, um, also probably from um, other larger healthcare organizations that may wish to participate in a in a pilot um, to help improve care. Um, oftentimes, again, if we can show that we can tie it to either improve patient care, uh, improve retention. Um, and uh, decreased turnover, then um, then often people are then often it pays for itself, and uh, and so there's more funding opportunities will be available when we tie it to those things. Okay, thank you. And could you expand on the peer support contractual agreement you mentioned earlier? Have you seen positive results? In what ways are you obligated to support each other? Oh yeah, great question. So that's going to be different at different organizations. I know at Brigham and Women's they have a very highly structured one that includes that you have um, specific training also in peer support and how to just listen for two minutes straight. You're not allowed. It, it's really interesting. I hope everyone can consider doing this at some point where where you are in a group of people and you pair up with another person and they tell you a story about some maybe a patient who changed them, and and you and you don't listen to ask a question. You just listen to listen. And, um, and so we're, we're taught better listening skills and the other person can t uh, feels it's different and you do too. And the idea there is small interventions can make big differences. Um, but in this case, so at the Brigham, they do that and, uh, and they, tie, they uh, pair you with another person and, um, and give you reminders um, about, about times to meet. Uh, where I work, how we did it at University of New Mexico, is that um, the person who was assigned to me, I could change if I wanted to. In my case, I thought that my assigned mentor was wonderful. And um, actually, we did not have time that we needed to do. We did have some protected time to do so in the organization, and that's also really important. You can't ask um, 
you know, a, a dad who has to get home to two kids and also put dinner on the table and take care of an um, elderly mom. Um, we can't ask them to add one more thing onto their day. But um, having, again, that structured time of maybe setting aside just one, one 15 or 20 or 30 minute visit that is um, once a month or every other month um, where people can have protected time to just sit together, be together. How is it going? Um, what you need help with? What's working? What's not working? Uh, can be really valuable. And in my organization, uh, we had dedicated time. It was an expectation and actually part of um, his, um, it, it was part of his uh, annual evaluation was how he met with me. And, uh, and it was also part of mine too. And, uh, and I thought it was, uh, it was invaluable. But, but it doesn't even have to be a giant structured program. I think that even taking 15 minutes out of different meetings that we have to ask people to turn to the person next to them and talk about a patient who changed them or talk about a challenge that they had and the other person just listening would also be a really valuable endeavor. All right, all of that's ringing some bells here. Uh, we actually have a webinar on the Star Center site also about stay interviews and that process of checking in with your team um, to avoid burnout, so that's really great. Oh, fabulous. All right, um, we've got a couple, like a time for a couple more questions here. Sorry, they're piling up. <laughs> um, what role does EMR play in burnout? Oh my goodness, yeah, it, it's very, you know, it's not the only thing. Um, I know why it feels like it's the only thing, but it's not, and there's lots of people who are study this in ongoing studies. So um, I think that the biggest thing about the way a lot of our EMRs are structured and the, a lot of the ways that we have been asked to interact with our EMRs is that it gets between us and our values, and our values having to do with the ability to connect with our patients. So some ways that, um, so it absolutely, how your EMR affects your ability to be connected to your values and how it adds, um, to your time pressure um, and how it affects your, how it creates work home interference, the idea that your work affects your home life more. Um, all those things will predict how your EMR and determine how your EMR is affecting your burnout um, or whether it will cause burnout or will reduce your burnout. Um, some ways that we can try to mitigate how our EMRs um, uh, get in the way of our home life, um, our connection to our values, our connections to our patients would be through um, uh, honestly, through uh, scribes, um, team documentation, MA order entry, and also more care protocols. Um, I, I can't overstate the value of um, care protocols are free. Hiring a scribe, I know, takes time, um, but uh, an MA order entry requires also training. But I cannot, which is time, um, I cannot overstate the value of care protocols and that a lot of the things that we do every day can actually be done by a protocol uh, via rather than us having to be staring at the patient clicking, rather than looking, excuse me, staring at the screen and clicking, rather than looking at the patient and engaging with them. I hope that, that right. was an answer, yeah. Yeah, um, I think we're actually gonna have to cut off the actual verbal question and answer portion right now, but if any of you out there still have questions that you'd like to ask, please feel free to submit them and we'll forward those along uh, to Dr. Barrett, and she can get in touch with you afterwards. Um, we've reached our hour mark, and thank you all for joining us today, and big thank you to Dr. Barrett for presenting on this topic. Um, like I said, feel free to ask any additional questions here, um, or you can follow up uh, with Dr. Barrett in person at ACU's annual conference over the summer. Um, all right, and just a quick but a wrap up here, um, if you enjoyed today's webinar, please let us know by tweeting at us, um, at AC underserved. Um, we're also on Facebook, um, but if you're still on Twitter, please use the hashtag ACU webinar series um, to collect some of your responses there. Follow us on Facebook and Twitter to stay up to date with some upcoming webinars, um, National Health Service Corps updates, information about the STAR Center trainings, and the ACU annual conference. Um, this presentation was uh, one of the most popular sessions at our conference last year, and it's a great example of the type of sessions that you will see at our upcoming conference this summer, um, which will be held in Washington, D.C. at the end of July. ACU members can register for the conference at a discounted price until June, so make sure you do that. And if you're not a member, you should be. Check out our member benefits and more information about the conference on our website, 
clinicians.org. All right. Um, we hope you can join us for the next webinar in this series on May 25th. Melissa Ryan, Operations Director of Policy and Shortage Designation at the Bureau of Health Workforce at HRSA, will present on key principles of shortage designation. Many state and federal programs use the health professional shortage areas designated by HRSA's Bureau of Health, health Workforce to make eligibility and funding decisions. This session will provide an overview of the types of HIPSAs and HIPSA designation criteria and how HIPSAs are scored. Head over to our website, clinicians.org, for more information. Again, thank you so much for joining us today. Please stick around to fill out the evaluation that will pop up on your screen shortly, and stay tuned for information on how to access the recording and slides from this presentation. Thank you. Have a great day.